Welcome everyone to Pontus Fathom Press. Uh, this is our podcast episode number 47 and we're going to be talking about uh, some works by William Gibson. I guess the kind of the idea here was um, I was always a big fan of Gibson cyberpunk books from Neuromancer and the Neuromancer's uh, uh, original trilogy, that Neuromancer sprawl trilogy, which is uh, Neuromancer, Count Zero, and Mona Lisa Overdrive. And these paperbacks have got cool covers sort of a modular endless city future and then the the bridge um trilogy. so this was the, the neuromancer is the first book of the sprawl trilogy and idoru is the second book of the bridge trilogy which started with virtual light and i, I always uh thought about this difference between this more hard hard kind of 80s version of uh, cyberpunk that the, the Sprawl uh, trilogy is, is, is really iconic for. You know, this is back in that kind of era of Acura and Ghost in the Shell and Blade Runner. It's all that kind of vibes coming out of this uh, Neuromancer era. And then this later um, virtual light series of Idoru, which was which came out in 96. So we're, we're talking about now we're in the 90s. And, and Gibson had a much different view of the future it was like i think he had once described it as you know at one point we thought the future was uh we thought the future was coming far away and then it's really as 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 we start realizing we're in the future all the time he started collapsing that down in in the idoru series and i think by the time he got to something like the peripheral and agency i think it's it, it's almost like retro causal future right so he's almost made the future the past right so an interesting flow of that but i kind of wanted to ex explore this so the topics here today are going to look at um the differences between neuromancer and idaru and sort of topics across the books and also put it in context of the current events you know with open ai and all of this um generative ai and llms that are going on out there and what's the future that that tech is going to make and I thought that these books have very different sentiments toward uh, the future of artificial intelligence from dystopia to sort of almost commercialized. And, and I think I kind of wanted to, to go into that space a bit. So, yeah, we'll start out with that. I think, um, you know, so both of these are novels by William Gibson. Uh, they both kind of have themes of uh, artificial intelligence. And if you haven't read them, uh, I, I'm going to go through them everything inside of them so if you don't want to spoil either of these I mean they're very old books so uh, just to say that but you know to start out like Neuromancer is more of a dystopian novel right so it explores uh, this concept of uh, AI it's very much a Blade Runner kind of environment but with the focus on there's an AI arising from sort of what they call cyberspace or the matrix so like this is back this is actually before there really was a a real public internet, you know, there was maybe a military internet, but it's kind of wrapped up in this world of, of, of cyberpunk tropes of like hackers and um, corporate uh, security and cyberspace, and these hackers are ice breaking that that security. And then in this um, uh, this in the backdrop of this, there's a rising AI that's achieving intelligence and self awareness. Right, and, and the novel of Neuromancer follows the sort of like this washed up hacker named Case and he's hired to pull off a job and it's hacking into the like basically like kind of like the, the, the cyberspace AI's neural network. So it's really there's really some some themes of ethics of AI, dangers of technological progress. You know, it's very dystopian and it's very deregulated where it's sort of like there's a black market black market of tech and um interesting kind of uh, hacker black market. Idur on the other side is following the story. Well, it's it's mostly around this AI uh, virtual idol singer, the uh, Iduru, which uh, Ray Toi, and um, uh, and her, it's like a virtual idol, kind of like an AI, is going to get married to a pop rock singer Rez, uh, Rez from the band Low Rez, right? So it's sort of like a human and AI are going to have this public 
paparazzi kind of marriage. And it kind of tracks this character, Lainey, who can look at trends in data and these nodal points of data. So now it's kind of like a, a shift a bit. It's still about artificial intelligence. There's still this idea of artificial intelligence having sentience, but it kind of looks more on this human relationships between AI and, and, and the complex ethics around self-awareness in AI, but it's very subtle. And uh, it does have some kind of ethical and, and, and psychological questions. So again, both the novels have this kind of idea of the potential of AI to develop consciousness, right? So the idea here is the ethics, there's ethics behind this and lack of ethics, you know. So Neuromancer, by taking this kind of dystopian approach, it really looks at this idea of the unregulated AI. And, and where you see in um, Neuromancer especially, it's as um, Winter Mute slash Neuromancer begin to develop, it's very much hacking the world to get Case to do its bidding. So it's, it's a very interesting space. Where um, Iduro, on the other hand, is a bit more like societal. It's more like the dawn. I think when he wrote this, it was kind of the dawn of social media. You know, there was a lot of talk about augmented reality and virtual reality space. And, and, and I think it was just social media was just starting to come online. So I think this is like really coming in that age of the infancy of social. But, you know, given that current client, climate of AI... It's interesting to see how the sentiment of these two works uh, kind of goes. Like both novels are kind of cautionary tales. One is more dystopian in a technotronic nightmare kind of way. And the other one is more dystopian in the idea of a capitalistic sort of um, uh, ethical problem. You know, so one one is more of a societal problem. One is more like a, you know... Uh, artificial intelligence industrial complex kind of problem. So can, maybe we'll do it in reverse order. Let's talk about Iduro a bit. So in Iduro, like, there, there's a virtual idol who's a celebrity in Japan. So this idol is a Rei Toi, and she has no physical uh, form at all. So she exists as, uh, you, you would think of it kind of like in a GPT sense, it's a virtual idol that all of her content and consciousness is sort of a complex algorithm of what the fans want, all the fan interactions, plus all of her distinct personality and identity traits that resonate with the fans. And so in a way, like the Aiduru is the AI evolving over time, a lot like the way pop celebrities will have their, you know, each, each new release, you know, whether it's, you know, things like, you know, pop singers today, like just think of any pop singer today, or think of K-pop is great for this, where they'll have a different concept each release. But it, this goes all the way back to things like David Bowie, right? David Bowie would have a new persona each time, right? So now we have this virtual version of this. And um, there's sort of this crisis of identity, right? So she, is she a real person? Is she not a real person? She's interacting with humans. And then there's sort of this blurring of the realities because then some of the activity takes place in that boundary between the virtual and the physical world. So while the Aiduru exists as music, as like holographic images, as some, um, as some concert performances, there's also that kind of question, and maybe there's like Espa was tapped into this kind of idea with their, their first wave of Espa, the K-pop band. So the idea of the, there's another world that's not the real world, it's the digital world. And all of these things that are happening in the digital world is, and that's where uh, maybe the rock star and the idol are going to meet in that digital world, and that's where they're going to have their life together, right? So it, it kind of raises this question, like what it means to be alive? Are virtual entities real in the virtual space? You know, um, there is a kind of reality to the virtual space, right? And then the Iduro has a kind of um, sort of like the challenge to humanity about what it means to be alive. All right, so Rei Toy is the name of the idol. And she's, um, she definitely has the idea of uh, a consciousness, right? She's very uh, sophisticated AI. It almost reminds me a bit of, you know, th th there's a dinner scene. There's a dinner scene in this uh, where they, it reminds me a bit of that Matrix Reloaded scene in which uh, the Merovingian and his wife are at the restaurant I think they kind of copied from this, perhaps, but it says, uh, 
Lainey couldn't remember. He said, don't look at the Iduro's face. She's not flesh. She's information. She's the tip of an iceberg. No, an Antarctic of information. Looking at her face would trigger it again. She was some unthinkable volume of information. She induced the nodal vision in some unprecedented way. He could watch her hands, watch the way she ate. The, so they're kind of like inside the simulation. The meal was elaborate. Many small courses served on individual rectangular plates. Each time a plate was placed between, before Ray and always within the field of whatever projected her, it was simultaneously veiled with a flawless copy, hollow food on a hollow plate. Each of the movements of her chopsticks brought on peripheral flickers of the nodal vision. Before the chopsticks were information too, but nothing as dense as her features. But when the flickering began, Laney would concentrate on his own meal, his clumsiness with his chopsticks, conversation around the table. Uh, the man with the rimless glasses was answering something Rez had asked, although Laney hadn't been able to catch the question. The result of an array of elaborate constructs that we refer to as desiring machines. Rez's green eyes, bright and attentive. Not in any literal sense, but please envision aggregates of subjective desire. It was decided that the modular array would ideally construct an architecture of articulated longing. Rez smiled and his eyes were going to, to the face of the Aiduru. He fell through her eyes. He was staring up at a looming cliff face that seemed to consist entirely of small rectangular balconies. He closed his eyes, looked down, and op opened them. Uh, yeah, so you kind of get this idea of looking at the idol is is almost triggering, right? The, the, they're not able to perceive everything that the idol has, right? So her consciousness is portrayed as emerging from her inter interactions, especially with the fans, not only when they're in the VR, but with the fans. And, um, and, and one of the themes throughout the book is as she... As her AI develops, as she starts to develop more uh, a more complex of self, she starts to be aware of her own existence and the and the nature of her existence. And I think this is where the two franchises kind of decide that it's not only a marriage between the two franchises, like a like a merger. It's also kind of like the two characters like each other. They're both rock stars. He likes her music. She likes his music. And so it's sort of like evolving in this, what is it? We don't know what it is. It's sort of this kind of speculative look into, it's a suggestion of what the future relationships between humans and AIs could be. I mean, something that's played out here with chatbots and uh, things like a replica, that whole replica scandal, like, you know, virtual, virtual companions, you know, something like this. So it's very ambiguous in the novel, but it kind of, you know, Gibson has a very light touch in this book where it's the idea of there is a self-consciousness, there is an evolution of it. And I want to say sort of, you know, pulling in Moldenhauer's psychoanalysis of artificial intelligence, it kind of fits in the tropes of this and the idea of it's a cinematic experience, right? So when you read through this, uh, you know, we think of all those AIs of, of, um, of cinema. And if we look at that uh, Deleuzean view of cinema... Right, desiring machines comes from that Deleuze. Right, uh, artificial intelligence. So the death in desiring machines says uh, artificial intelligence has made significant strides uh, as AI continues to evolve. The field of artificial intelligence emerges in a way understood. In psychoanalysis, the idea of the death drive was first proposed by Sigmund Freud. According to Freud, the death drive is an unconscious desire of death and destruction inherent in all beings. So this kind of links into the idea of Lacan's death of the father. And just the idea here of um, what would the desire be? Is it an Oedipal desire? What kind of desire comes out of this? So this desiring machine concept is explored throughout this. But in the sense of, of um, uh, Deleuze, uh, who kind of coins that in his anti-Oedipus, the desiring machine concept, I believe, is a bit like um, cinema. So I think that what's nice about these books... Gibson style is it's very much uh, draws up an image and then doesn't say much about it. It gives us lots of details and lots of characteristica, but it doesn't really kind of make a judgment on it other than in the activities, right? So um, in, in Neuromancer, on the, other, on the other hand, right, we have more of that, uh, we have more of that, uh, original cyberpunk kind of idea. So with Neuromancer, you have more of the 
uh, Blade Runner type world, that ghost in the shell. So things are very obvious. Case, he's a hacker. He enters into the um, the Matrix. And you got to see before the internet, it was almost visioned, envisioned as a hallucinatory experience. So uh, more than VR is to us, it was kind of the idea of your consciousness would project into um, a landscape of the internet that you would move through. Sort of like the way the Matrix showed the the way um, the code was actually the structure of everything, right? So when they're inside the matrix, that was, there was a number of scenes in which the green code was forming the objects, something like this, right? And um, so that boundary between the real world and the digital world. So in Neuromancer, um, there's two AIs that develop in Neuromancer. There's a uh, Neuromancer and Wintermute. So N Neuromancer, has evolved beyond its original programming. He's sort of the sum total of the of the matrix, sort of like the way ChatGPT it's 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 trained on all of the internet, and um, it's also kind of trying to find its place in the world. And then there's Wintermute, a, another AI uh, that's wanting to merge with Neuromancer. So these AIs are kind of global AIs that are looking to to, to merge together, right? So this is the idea of they're also um, developing complex ideas. One thing that they're obsessed with is the idea of voodoo. And they talk about the gods of the crossroads, like Papa Legba and these kind of concepts. So, so but, uh, and then maybe a, a, an excerpt of this that's kind of real interesting is, you know, you've got these, um, there's a scene where Case, uh, the hacker, the main hacker of the story, he's in a, He's in a low orbital satellite ship, this tug called the Marcus Garvey. And uh, his partner, Molly Millions, she's trying to break into this Tesher Ashpool, Ashpool, Ashpool satellite, I guess. It's like a low orbital satellite where these super rich and, and very bizarre kind of cloned 1% um, kind of types. And meanwhile, so, so in, in this kind of reminiscent of, remember in Blade Runner 2049 when when um, Kay has got um, his virtual girlfriend and he's got the real human girlfriend and they're sort of merge, they overlap each other. Something uh, evocative of this where, so cases, uh, so imagine the place of this. I've got Blanchot's space of literature on, on the table here. The, the idea here is where are, where are people, right? So in, 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 in Idoru, they're having a virtual meal together. They're sort of like in this simulation to see the meal. So it's sort of like the metaverse idea. But in Neuromancer, he, uh, uh, Gibson was much more cyberpunk. He was much more hardcore in this. So you've got Case's physical body up in a ship orbiting a satellite. He's going to log into the internet while his body's on this ship. So his body's already off the earth. Then he's going to leave his body to go into cyberspace back on Earth, sort of like into the network, and hacking at um, the, actually he's hacking at the Tesheraspool AI. So he's trying to hack through their security. And then he's flipping the channel between um, his hacking view and a uh, SimStim implant. So there's an implant inside of Molly, who's a human, and he can actually see, what, see and feel what she's feeling. So the idea is by changing the channels, just like we could surf the internet, but he's actually, his consciousness is, not only is his body off the earth, but his consciousness is in cyberspace. And then he can flip to put his consciousness inside the body of his partner. And, 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 and also he's got a third friend who's the Dixie Flatline. It's a hacker who has died, a hacker that died, but they kept all of his memories into this piece of hardware so he can help Case hack like his co-pilot. And uh, I'll just kind of go into uh, this a bit. So he says, uh, uh, I'll just read a little bit of this to give you a feel of this. Um, See what the ghost is saying, Malcolm said. Computer keeps asking for you. Some Japanese, now we're going to join Mr. Armitage, come up on Freeside. So Case put the electrodes on and he jacked into, the, into cyberspace. Dixie? The Matrix showed him the pink spheres of the steel combine in Skyrim, Skykin. What's getting up to, boy? I've been hearing lurid stories. Hosaka's patched us into a twin back on your boss's boat now. Really hopping. 
You pull some Turing heat? Yeah, but winter mutes killed him. Well, that won't hold him long. Plenty more where those came from. Be up here in force. He's talking about the Turing police. Plenty more where they came from. Uh, bet their decks are all over the grid sector like flies on crap. And here your boss, Case, he says go. He says run and run it now. Case punched for the free side coordinates. Let me take a, let me take that a sec, Case. The matrix blurred and flashed phased as a flat line executed an intricate series of jumps with the speed and accuracy that made Case wince with envy. Dixie, hey boy, I was good. I was that good when I was alive. You ain't seen nothing. No hands. That's it, huh? Big green rectangle off to the left. You got it. Corporate core data for Tesher Aspool SA. And that ice is generated by their two friendly AIs. On par with anything in the military section, looks to me. That's King Hell Ice Case. Back to the grave and slick as glass. Fry your brain as soon as you look at it. We get any closer now? It'll have tracers up your butt and both of ears. But tell them the boys in TA boardroom that the size of your shoes and how long you are. This isn't looking so hot, is it? I mean, the Turing's are on it. I was thinking maybe you should try to bail out. I can take you. No, you want to see that Chinese program can do? Well, I case stared at the green wall of the TA ice. Well, yeah, we're, we run. Slot it. Hey, Malcolm, Case said, jacking out. So now he's jacked out of the internet and he's talking to Malcolm in the tub. Tug. And then he flips the channel. I'm going to check on Molly, Case said, tapping the sim stim switch. Free fall. The, sim, the sensation was like diving through the perfectly clear water. She was falling, rising through the wide tube of fluted lunar concrete, lit at a two-meter intervals by rings of white neon. The link was one way. He couldn't talk to her. He flipped. Boy, that was one mean piece of software. Hottest thing since sliced bread. This thing's invisible. And I just rented 20 seconds at, on that little pink box. Four jumps to the left of the TA ice. He had a look at what to look like. We don't. We're not there. Case searched the matrix around Tesher Aspool Ice until he found the pink structure, a standard commercial unit, and punched in closer to it. Maybe it's defective. Maybe, but I doubt it. Our baby's military, though, and, not, and knew it just doesn't register. And if it did, we'd see it as some kind of Chinese sneak attack. But nobody's twigged to us at all. Maybe not even the folks in stray light. Well, that's an advantage, right? Maybe, the construct said. Case winced at the suggestion. I checked old Kwong 11 for you, boy. It's real friendly as long as you're on the trigger. Just polite and helpful as can be. Speaks good English, too. You ever hear of a slow virus before? No. I did once. Just an idea back then. But that's what old Kwang's all about. It ain't bore and inject. It's more like we interface with the ice so slow the ice doesn't feel it. The face of the Quang logic kind of sleezes up to the target and mutates. So it gets to be exactly like the ice fabric. Then we lock on and the main program cuts in, starts taking circles around the logic in the ice. We go Siamese twins on them before they can get restless, the flatline laughed. Wish you weren't so damn jolly today, man. That laugh of yours really gets to me in the spine. <laughs> Too bad, the flatline said. Old dead man needs his laughs. Case slapped the Simstim switch and crashed through tangled metal in the smell of dust. The heels of his he hands skidding on the slick stuck paper. Something behind him collapsed. So, so he's he's. You can see how this sense of space is very strange, right? He's kind of like hacking between different areas, um, and um, and I think this is kind of like that theme of that more hardcore cyberspace, right? It's more like a it's like a bank heist story. Where this is more like a social media uh, scandal, right? It's a, it's the difference in action between a social media scandal, and and I think this is Gibson's sort of trajectory that he went. Like he went like the future. We thought the future was going to be um, flying cars, and it ended up just being um, airbags in cars, and then driverless cars, right? So it's like sort of the action gets sucked out of things, but it gets more more nuanced and more realistic. You know, this kind of reminds me, too, of when, when Lacan talks about, um, you know, how dramatic the Oedipus complex is. Like Freud's Oedipus complex is about killing the father, marrying the mother. This is very dramatic. He's like, where, where's the, like, where's the story of, like, the modern day Oedipus complex, which is sort of like a frustrated housewife, right? This is from, from Lacan's time. But the idea of, like, you know, you, you, you're, 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 you're home, you're working, like, think of it like this, uh, work at home complex right you're working at home 
kind of could be bored. What is the story of that? Like nobody's, nothing is so dramatic as an Oedipus complex. So this idea of, of, of modulating into the new, um, into the new space, I thought it was kind of, kind of interesting. Uh, the other, yeah, the other character that comes up in, um, in, in the two books, like, you know, we had, we talked about Rez as the rock star who sort of like idealizes, uh, Ray and he's going to marry her. Right. So this idea of Rez is also a reclusive otaku kind of individual. He's a rock star, but he kind of like, he wants to be a cultural idol, but he wants to be left alone. And Ray, by marrying her, they can just live in their digital world together. So they have a kind of privacy and anonymity away from the physical world. So you get this, again, in the space of where is the human digital consciousness living, sort of like that we explored in, um, in, um, in Neuromancer. The, the Dixie Flatline is very interesting. Like the Dixie Flatline um, that we, we interacted with a little bit. So he was a... Uh, so Case is the hacker, and he's working with this pocket artificial intelligence, the Dixie Flatline, whose his name was Dixie Flatline. He was a hacker. That was his hacker handle, let's say. And basically, after he died, they made a construct out of his memories. And he sort of co-pilots Case. But when you, when, you, when you read it, it's kind of like a buddy film vibe, right? So the idea between Case and this AI is very much like he's got this buddy. But at one kind of ominous point, yeah, and the thing is, all of his quirks and idiosyncrasies are there. You can see the way he talks, the way he jokes. He's got this weird laugh, right? They both respect each other. Uh, Case likes to watch him work. Dixie likes to watch how Case works. They've got this really realized um, uh, interaction, this kind of uh, exchange between each other, much like you people who are detecting these sparks of consciousness in, in ChatGPT are today. But at the same time, there's something off about it, right? When, when, when Dixie Flatline laughs, Case is um, unnerved by it. And, um, and I think it, later on in the book, the, the Dixie Flatline says, hey, you know, I'm realizing a bit that I'm not me anymore. I'm just this kind of static version of me. And, and the Dixie Flatline kind of asks him to unplug him, like to smash him so he doesn't, doesn't have to live. Because like, it's sort of like, imagine if you wake up every day and you're just, it's a, it's a unit that's you, but there's no growth. It's ROM, right? The Dixie Flatline exists as ROM, they describe it. So it's sort of like read-only memory. It's, so it's like no new memories are made. It's just like a static, unlearning kind of AI. So very, very strange kind of, kind of con concept. Uh, you know, so some of those themes between the two points of view, you know, so some identity and subjectivity themes, right? So think about the symbolic order, Lacan's symbolic order, right? So sh symbolic order sort of shapes individual uh, subjectivity. And you can see how that's constructed in, in Gibson's language and the sort of the culture of the world building, right? So in Neuromancer, you basically see this idea of Case, the hacker, and he's kind of, he's a washed up hacker. He's had his nervous system ruined with neurotoxins so he can't enter the matrix anymore and now he's given his second um his second life through like these drugs and through these uh cybernetic implants and through his cybernetic deck he can kind of access the uh the internet again and the dixie flatline again he's a fragmented personality right he's got a fractured identity he's a he's a ghost in in the in the rom kind of thing and i think these similar themes are in iduru also it's like Ray is trying to be human, but to be human, she wants to do human things. So they're going to live in the digital world and she's going to marry a human. And you sort of see that these themes about the relationships uh, and the self are really, really uh, front and center. And it really blurs the line between what's, what's in the cyberspace matrix, uh, what's physical, what's virtual, and and explores kind of in a subtle, in a cinematographic way, where it just kind of puts these scenes in front of us. The concept of the AI being in these situations, and we're left to sort of make what we want of the, of the experience, right? Um, this idea of the construct, right? And sort of, I guess, one thing that comes out of that concept of desire and language in the symbolic order I mean, they mentioned desiring machine. They call Ray a desiring machine. Um, 
uh, so you have this concept of the other, right? Uh, each of the otherness of um, Molly and Case, of Dixie and Case, of the weirdness of the Tesher Aspools. So the the Tesher Asp Ashpool concept, we haven't talked about this lady, Lady Three Jane. So inside of the, uh, so there's a, Tesher Aspool is a family with vast wealth and, and power in the Neuromancer. And they in, inhabit the Villa Straylight. So it's a space station in orbit around the Earth. And Lady Three Jane is kind of like um, the heiress to the fortune. But I think she's part clone. They, they live isolated from the world. They're just kind of controlling the world from the satellites. Think of them as like option traders in space. But they're like AI brokers, sort of. Um, and their value systems have evolved with the weirdness of their evolution. So imagine an endless wealth. And you just look at the weirdness of, you know, they say Holly weird, right? The weird stuff that comes out of Hollywood celebrity news, which I think is kind of like the direction that I think Lady Three Jane kind of shows that direction that Gibson's going to be attracted to going from a the heiress of a wealthy AI owning space faring low orbital satellite cloned family going toward more like the values of social media and the virtual idol that you see in, in Idero. So um, she's like definitely the heiress and she's a power broker, but she's also a pawn in the game. So it's sort of like all of the different agencies and connected forms of the Tesher Ashpool are, um, you know, really uh, comments on the themes of power, on agency, on, on technology shaping the limit of what being human is. Sort of a, a symbol of transhumanism, right? So then I think in the, you know, maybe with Blanchot coming in, there's a lot of in, um, there's a lot of strangeness on the spaces of the novel, right? So there's a whole disorientation in Villa Strela. You know, it's in a satellite. She's a clone. A lot of their activity though happens in in power brokering down on the earth. And so you start to see that there is this sort of digital space again, you know, this eighth sphere type of stuff. I think maybe in Blanche Show we can just read this section that says um, uh, the other. Um, well, one thing is the this idea of the it's sort of a knight. He talks about a knight in here. Maybe we'll go into the abhorrence of the vacuum. Communication, the reader yet to come. I wanted to see this thing about the light. Dark, darkness, and are they at Orpheus? Is, are the night as trap? The first night is another of day's constructions. Day makes the night. It builds up its strong points in the night. Night speaks only of the day. It is the presentiment of the day. Day's reserves in its profundity. Everything ends in the night. And that is why there is day. Day is linked to night because it would not be day if it did not begin and come to an end. That is the rule that goes by. It is beginning and end. Day arises day is done. And what it makes is indefatigable, industrious, and creative. And that what makes day the incessant labor of the day. The more it expands with the proud aim of becoming universal, the more the nocturnal element threatens to withdraw into the light itself. The more nocturnal in that which enlightens us, the more it is the uncertainty and immensity of the night. When we oppose night and day, and the movements accomplished to each, it is still to the night of day that we allude, to the night that is the day's night, the night of which we say that it is the true night, for it has day's truth just as it has day's laws, those which precisely assign to the duty of opposing itself to the day. Thus for the Greeks to submit to dark destiny is to assure balance, moderation, and respect for the immediate and thus exact respects from it. That is why it is so necessary for the Greeks that the daughters of night, which I think are the fates, the fates were the daughters of night, right? The fates were called the daughters of night. Um, 
the daughters of night not be dishonored, but nonetheless they have their domains and keep them there, that they are not errant or elusive, but checked and held to the oath of this restriction. But the other night is always other. Only in the day does it seem comprehensible, ascertainable. In the day it is secret. It is the secret which could be disclosed. It is something concealed that awaits an unveiling. The other night is revealed as love that breaks all ties, that wants the end in union with the abyss. But in the night, it is where one never joins. It is repetition that will not leave off, satiety that has nothing, the sparkle of something baseless and without depth. The trap, the other night, is the first night which we can penetrate, which we enter, granted with anguish. And yet here, anguish secludes us and insecurity becomes a shelter. In the first night, it seems that we will go by going further ahead towards something essential. And this is correct to the extent that the first night still belongs to the world and through the world today's truth. There is always the essence of danger at hand. There is always a moment when in the night, the beast hears the other beast. This is the other night. And this is in no way terrifying. It says nothing extraordinary. It has nothing in common with ghosts or nuances. It is only muffled whisperings, a noise that can be hardly distinguished from silence, the seeping sands of silence, not even that. So I think where where, where I'm I'm going with this one is, I think both of these books kind of end up in the same place in that, you know, uh, no matter how dystopian... um, uh, the world is cases struggle to find uh, re- regain his status as a, as a hacker right the Tesher ass pools and their power struggle right the, the Dixie flatline existing as a as an AI winter mute and, and neuromancer uh, coming into existence as conscious AIs there is always this sort of like endless transformation that's going on and I think it's similar in Enduro also you see that the the, the social world is evolving uh, the AIs are looking to have more human experiences. The humans are looking to have more private experiences. And this is that marriage of low and res, right? So you sort of see this, um, this sort of atmosphere, this mood, right? The physical space of Tokyo is uh, central to Idaru. And like in, in the same way where in, in the Neuromancer, it starts out as in the sprawl, but it moves up into these low orbital satellites, right? And we see that in that passage I read where Case is simultaneously moving through spaces. He's in cyberspace. He's inside of Molly's body. He's on the satellite. He's uh, in, uh, hacking the corporate ice, right? You have an idea of where where are you in the world. Like, and, and it's also, this is very atmospheric and it's also very um, uh, fluid in the sense of... Uh, it shapes what our experiences are going to be like more and more. And I think that's something that's interesting about this chat GPT space. I was recently looking at this thing that said, will programming die? Will this be the end of programming? And the idea is uh, that was interesting. It was sort of a uh, Wolfram w- was talking about it. He said something to the effect of when we drive a car or say when we use our cell phone, we don't have to be cell phone engineers, right? We don't have to understand everything that the phone is doing. We just need to know who we want to call, who we want to chat with. When we drive a car, we don't know, have to know the, the, the exact fuel to air ratio of the fuel injection system. We just want to drive somewhere, right? So I think that what's coming in this rise of things like um, AI and chat GPT space and the idea of um, you know, beyond the question of consciousness, it's more like the, the way these tools are evolving into something else. And the spaces that we're going to start inhabiting will be changing. But I do think that there is that question, obviously, you know, when we look at it through the lens of cyberspace, kind of uh, cyberpunk view, when we look at it more like a social VR kind of space, a a celebrity space, um, you really see that the consciousness and self-awareness is still a similar concept that was in Gibson's writing, right? So the idea of with Ray... She has developed a degree of consciousness, and even though she's an artificial cr- construct, by blurring what's real and what's physical, the mental space still arises where her consciousness can uh, 
evolve and think and replicate and, and live. And it's the same thing with the the cyber uh, the the cyberspace or the matrix world of Neuromancer, where things are so tangible, like corporate security is like a tangible pyramid, or 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 security measures are called ice, and then uh, breaking the ice, these ice crackers, or what the hackers doing it. It's almost like it's become a physical thing. Um, and things like the Dixie Flatline, where his laughter is somewhat uncanny valley, right? All of these things are um, mimicking simulations and uh, at the same time co-real, right? There's a, they're giving us a perspective into these realities. So I think, uh, you know, maybe I'll leave it at that. Um, you know, one thing that I was going to talk about in the next uh, podcast was uh, I wanted to talk about this concept of... Uh, materialism versus corporealism and maybe i'm going to do a i'm going to continue this series um i would like to do a sprawl series let me know down in the comments if you want to see me do a i can do a deep dive into william gibson's neuromancer sprawl series that would be a great one to get into i think the next two i'm going to do is i i want to jump into um i'm going to do a, a ghost in the shell kind of Acura, I've got, I've got this amazing Acura set here that I would like to talk a bit about. Acura, Acura, uh, and also Ghost in the Shell. I was thinking of maybe approaching them from the idea of materialism and corporealism, which is the idea of, you know, Gibson's writing is very much grounded in scientific materialism. You know, when you think of somebody like, say, say the sci-fi of Philip K. Dick versus the sci-fi of William Gibson. Uh, William Gibson is definitely like the ghost in the shell. And I, I want to tap into some of these concepts of consciousness in Ghost in the Shell and Acura. The idea of um, transhuman power and, and, and Acura. And also the idea of where is the puppet master? What, what's, what's this emergent property? I think those would be the probably the next couple um, podcasts that will come out. But guys, let me know um, if you're interested in the podcast... Uh, supporting us please leave your comments below i love to read them would like to turn this into a bit of a dialogue um check out our bookstore i, I did mention uh moldenhauer's psychoanalysis of artificial intelligence volumes one and two of artificial psychology of desiring machines are out there on our bookstore uh, you can get them where fine books are sold online our bookstore would be the best place we are looking to release volume three computational complexity and psychiatric agency I would say that these are kind of a Lacanian approach to um, AI and desiring machines. We also have launched our first volume of the podcast series. Volume one is available, uh, Jungian Alchemy and Horror and Science Fiction. We talk about Philip K. Dick, Frank Herbert, H.P. Lovecraft in volume one. That will move on to uh, some pulp fiction where we talk about anime and some pulp like Solomon Kane, John Carter of Mars, and Conan. And then finally, we're going to go into the esoteric anthroposophy of occulted history these are all the podcasts that came out during the pandemic i've got the one up on the dragon in draft form the um, podcast series we did on the dragons so guys uh leave your comments below like and subscribe you can check out our patreon for as little as a dollar you can check out some of the books and uh thanks a lot for supporting uh the channel uh if you could um subscribe ring the bell and you can get notified when the next podcast comes out i've been trying to make these a bit more regular uh just the note taking in the process i'm going to put some inside baseball things out on the patreon if you want to see some of the notes of the upcoming podcasts and a couple chapters from the books if you want to check those out so thanks a lot for watching we'll see you in the next podcast and uh talk to you soon bye bye everyone